brothers and sisters in Christ. Today we're going to be talking about all things work together for good, question mark. Okay. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Romans 8.28. But before we get started, I want to start with a hymn. God's trying to get me back into hymns and singing hymns. Right now we're, I'm going through the Psalms uh, in my day-to-day -day listening to the Word of God. And King David loved a man after God's own heart. He loved to sing hymns. He loved to sing psalms and hymns. All right? Paul talks about singing psalms and hymns, especially if you remember reading about Paul when he was arrested, when they were beaten, thrown in prison. Uh, Peter and John were singing hymns. Paul and uh, uh, Barnabas, Paul and Silas, and Timotheus, Timothy, they were singing hymns. So, the hymn for today that God put on my heart is called, Great is Thy Faithfulness. So if you want to pause the video and look up the hymn and try to sing along, I'm going to try to keep the tempo right and try to keep the, the, uh, the levels of singing. My singing, God loves our singing. Right? Even if you don't sing, think you sing the best, God loves our singing, as long as it, our heart is in the right place. There are people that have amazing voices and their heart is in the right place. There's people that have horrible voices, but their heart is in the right place. It's always a heart issue. So great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and the peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. It's a good old hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness. So if you got your King James Bibles open, Romans 8.28, Great is Thy Faithfulness. All things work together for good. All things work together for good. Now, I open the book up and I say, you know, Romans, if you have these people what we call cherry pickers in the Bible. They're cherry pickers. So it's, what a cherry picker does is they go, Romans 8.28. They quietly read Romans 8.28, if I can ever get there. <laughs> I got my big book out. They have thinner pages, so I got to be careful how I turn. But Romans 8.28. This was my new book I was starting to highlight in. And I'll fit, try to finish highlighting this winter. But Romans 8.28. Over here. And we know that all things work together. They'll read this in their head. I know all things work together for good to them that love God. I'm whispering. To them that love God. To them that are called according to His purpose. They're seeing it in His head and they're like, hmm. I love the part where it says, and all, we know that all things work together for good. So then they'll go, we know all things work together for good. Romans chapter 8, 28, all things work together for good. No matter what you're going through, all things work together for good. Is that true? Well, you say you're reading it. Is that true? All things work together for good, and they put a period there. Like there's no other part to the verse. Period. All things work together for good. Well, let's, let's, you don't have to turn here, but Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. What about the lost world? All things work, uh, let's see, for the, for the wages of sin is death. 
But all things work together for good. So the wages of sin is death. That works together for good. Some people say, well, if you keep reading that verse, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Absolutely. God will put roadblocks. He'll send the Holy Spirit out to reprove the world of sin. The laws of God are written on every man's heart. The laws are, are schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That conviction to get us under repentance. You know, that nasty word repentance as it applies to salvation that the lost world doesn't want. They don't want that good. But the actual sin itself, the wages of sin, is death. That's not good. And it doesn't work together for good. How do we know that? Because in Matthew 7, 13, this is Jesus Christ himself speaking, Enter ye into the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. There's a lot of people that stay under the wages of sin is death. That stay under the law of sin and death. They're never free. They're never liberated. They're not given the liberty that we're given. That's in Christ Jesus our Lord. They're stuck under the law of sin and death. They die under the law of sin and death. They die with their sins, their wages, and they wind up in hell. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go there and at. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Could you imagine these, these I, I, the reason I'm doing this study by this Christ is a lot of these prosperity gospel people, the easy believe is in faith alone, you know, and prosperity gospel, your best life now. Right? They're like, all oh, things work together good. I've seen men of God that profess to be King James Bible believers, and I believe they're saved. I believe they love the Word of God, but they've been spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. And not after Christ. And their congregation, these Babel buildings, some of them are hirelings, hardcore hirelings, prosperity gospel preachers. But even some of the preachers that aren't prosperity gospels, they'll grab this and they look at their audience and they see that half the people are lost. Or they question half the people, you know, false converts. Paul talks about false brethren, counterfeits. They've never given their life to Jesus Christ of the cross. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. And they'll look at them and go, well... All the bad things they're going through, i got to try to tell them something nice. So I'll say all things work together for good. And yet if they don't truly get saved and born again, where are they going to wind up? In hell, to burn for all eternity. Could you imagine someone in hell? Or I'm not saying we can go to hell, but can you imagine a preacher telling somebody in hell, Hey, all things work together for good. I don't worry about it. All things work together for good. When they put a period right at the end. Now, if the Bible said, and we know that all things work together for good, and there's a period, I'd have to accept it. I'd have to conform to the Bible. i have to trust God, and if He says it, He says it. But if you have your Bible open, and you've turned to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, you'll say, hey, you haven't finished the rest of the verse. When they just say, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good, they don't finish the rest of the verse. How about this? If you're lost and you do do good works that line up with this book, you know they're worthless? Uh, Titus 1.15 says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. There's nothing good that comes from that. They profess that they know God. I'm talking about a false convert, false brethren. They profess that they know God, but in works, they deny Him. Paul says, prove all things. Check whether ye be in the faith. Prove yourselves. If any man be in Christ, if a man be called a brother in Christ, prove it. Are you saved? Prove it. Here's somebody that their works say, hey, they're not saved. That there's no changed life. Well, what do you expect when the number one gospel that's most popular, false gospel that's popular in the world, is this faith alone, easy believism? They turn the free gift into free grace. And we've already talked about that. I believe that it's a free gift. That free gift is eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, just go through real quick. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. You say faith alone, that makes it of yourselves. They just went against the scriptures when they said faith alone. It's not faith alone. We're saved by God's grace through faith. 
That's the proper way to say it. That's the proper way to teach it. But when they take it and screw up the gospel and say, no, it's just faith alone, because there's repentance. Preaching repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to get to that too here in a second. But you have to repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And after he saves you, the, there's supposed to be evidence. You're supposed to be able to prove that you're saved with the changed life, the new creature in Christ Jesus. The old man is dead and buried. But here's people that there is no new life. There is no new birth. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable. When you have someone who presses, professes to be saved and born again, sometimes they don't say born again, I just, they just call themselves a Christian. I understand that word's been so perverted. I understand some of the brethren, I disagree with the brother in Christ because he thinks we should never use the word Christian, but I understand where he's coming from. That word Christian has been perverted so much that you start to get a bad taste in your mouth just using the word Christian. Because it's been so abused. They're abominable when you have someone who professes to be in Christ. Christian in Christ. And they're not. Being an abominable and disobedient. And unto every good work reprobate. You mean their good works are worthless? They're going to wind up in hell and their good works don't mean anything. But all things work together for good. All things work together for good. How about some verses for both saved and lost? Romans chapter 2, verse 6. Romans chapter 2, verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who are patient, continue in well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, unto every good work reprobate. Do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. But all things work together for good. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But all things work... I'm going to keep quoting that because they'll just keep brainwashing people by saying all things work together for good, all things work together for good, yet the Bible is clear that there are certain things that don't work together for good. Number one, going to hell. We're going to get into it with Safe Center here too. Verse 10, But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. But this is Christ when it says he'll render every man his deeds. If you're saved, we still have the judgment seat of Christ. And I might end up losing rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. That doesn't work together for good. I'm going to lose rewards that, I'm, that I could have had for all eternity. We're all going to stand up there and we're going to suffer loss. And we're going to get rewards and we're going to suffer loss. And the way the Bible talks about, once again, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But the judgment seat of Christ, it talks about how... You shall be saved as so by fire. Even if all your works are burned up, that person is saved as, as so by fire. They get in by the skin of their teeth, as, they, as we say. You know, They get in, they're saved. They got that crown of life, they're saved. But they got nothing to show for all eternity. That doesn't work out for good. Getting to go into heaven for eternity? Yes, that works out for good. But not all things. Remember it says all things work together for good. When I stand before Jesus Christ as the judgment seat of Christ to be judged as a saved sinner, sinner who is saved by God's grace, okay, and I lose rewards, it doesn't work out for good. My getting saved and getting to go to heaven, that worked out for good. But how I get to spend eternity? Saved at the judgment seat of Christ, lost at the great white throne judgment. Everyone's going to have to answer to God. It's just when we answer God at the judgment seat of Christ, our eternity is not on the line. Our everlasting life is not on the line. But when the lost world gets judged at the great white throne judgment, they're being judged under the law of sin and death, according to the Levitical laws, and their sin and works are being judged, and their eternity is on the line. Ours, our eternity isn't on the line. But how we get to spend eternity is. I can't push it so much in these last days that I'm getting way ahead of myself, but the judgment seat of Christ matters. Looking for that blessed hope and, and realizing that someday we're going to have to answer to God. We need to get busy living for the Lord. It matters. But the stuff that we lose, all things work together for good. No, it doesn't. 
If there was a period there, I'd have to accept it. But when the lost world puts a period there, when there is no period, the Bible says, even if you add a period, add thou not to his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. They're lying. They're lying to themselves, and they're lying to the world to make themselves feel good and to make the world feel good. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's for both saved and lost. Uh, for the saved at the judgment seat of Christ, the lost at the great white throne to be judged. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap to the flesh corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reach, reap life everlasting. Okay. We're, how we get to spend everlasting life for those who are saved. Okay. When it talks about he that soweth to this flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, Romans 8, 20, Romans chapter 8, verse 12 reads, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And you go back to that verse in Galatians 6, 8, it says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. If you lift after the flesh, you're not going to have the long life that God wanted you to have so you can earn as many rewards as you possibly can at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to die early, and you're going to show up, and you're going to miss out on a lot of rewards, which goes back to, but he that sow to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. The longer we live down here serving the Lord, the more rewards we have. Now Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I'd rather be up there with my Lord and Savior than down here, but we're down here for a reason. To be a living witness and a verbal witness. But when you have a Christian that starts backpedaling, and they die early and they go home because they're messing up with the flesh, they're trying to resurrect the old man, does that work together for good when they lose a lot of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ? They just get in by the skin. Does that work? No, it doesn't. But it says all things work together for good, brother. All things work. How about we read the whole verse instead of being these cherry, cherry pickers that just grab one little thing. I've seen that with some great men of God. They have good preachings when they use the whole, they get the context of a verse. They read the whole verse. They have really horrible teachings when they just grab a little thing in the verse and that's it. And they ignore the context. Right. What's the context here? Romans chapter 8, verse 28. How about we read the whole thing out loud so everyone can read it? And we know that all things work together for good. There's no period. There's no comma. To them that love God, there's the first requirement for all things to work together for good. To them who are called according to His purpose, there's the second requirement. You say, what? There's supposed to be a requirements? No, no, no. Just all things work together for good. So no matter what happens to me, good or uh, with the bad things that happen, it's all, for, you know, it's, it all works together for good. Do you meet those first two requirements? Are those two, those two requirements? And we're going to get into them. If you don't meet those two requirements, not everything works together for good. See, it's not a contradiction in the Bible. They make contradictions when they start adding periods, when they start ignoring half the verses and cherry picking. Cutting up the Word of God, keeping what they like, throwing out what they don't like. There's two requirements. Okay. What's the, uh, what's the first requirement? Love God. Now, when someone says, I love God, is it just a statement that we say? Brother says, Christ, I think we've talked about this before, but when I go walking, there's some people that say, how are you doing? And they keep walking. They weren't asking a question. They, turn, they used that statement as, as a salutation, just something like saying, hey, and they keep walking. No, when you ask a question, you're supposed to stop and wait for an answer. But it just becomes something you say, and you, miss, you don't use it right. You don't use it properly. You just say it, hey, how's it going, and you keep walking. I remember several times I went to stop to say something, and they just kept walking. And I'm like, ugh. I they don't really care about how you're doing. They don't want to know how you're doing. It just means something you say. And in this lost world with all these false Christs and false religions, you have people say all the time, I love God. It's just something you say. I love Jesus Christ, who is God the Father, manifest in the flesh. I love Jesus Christ. It's just something people say. Some people say it's a feeling. It's a burning in the bosom. 
And sometimes we wonder, is it just heart indigestion? You just have indigestion, you know? You got heartburn or something? Because love is something that does start in the heart, but it comes out in action, it comes out in deeds. Once again, you're supposed to have evidence. You're supposed to have proof. And what does the Bible say? If you want to turn to John 14, 15, it says, this is Jesus Christ talking. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. See, these false religions out there, they don't like this. They don't like what the biblical definition of loving God is. What is loving God? Keeping His word. Keeping His commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Thy words are pure words, therefore thy servant loveth them. And many other verses. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Receive the engrafted word that's able to save your soul. John 14, 23, we read, if you jump down to verse 23, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. What's evidence that you love God? You're keeping his words. You're taking his words, you're hiding them in your heart, and you're living them. In the Old Testament, all throughout the Bible, true love for God has always been, you take God's word, you fear God, and you keep his commandments. Period. That's true love for God. Pleasing Him. Um, the verse in, the old, in Revelation, it's, uh, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created to please God. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus, remember it says, For God so loved, past tense, the world. Jesus gave his life to those who would repent and come to the cross and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So for those of us who are saved and born again that actually came to the cross broken, he gave his life for us. Verse 14, so what can we do for Him? If we truly love Him, we give our lives to Jesus Christ at the cross. The old man is dead and buried. And God gives us a new man. But we give our life to Jesus at Christ at the cross. There's no greater love than this. But you have people that act like, my life is my own. I do what I want when I want. Nobody tells me what to do. There is no final authority. And they live however they want. And then they'll try to grab this verse and say, all things work together for good. No, they don't for you. Because you don't meet the two requirements. The first one is loving God. You fear Him and you keep His commandments. The evidence that you love God is your, your whole heartfelt desire is, I want to do things your way, Lord, because it pleases you. And that's why I was created. Verse 14 says, Ye are my friends, this is Jesus Christ speaking, you're my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Once again, evidence that you love God to the point that you gave your life to Jesus Christ at the cross is that now you do things God's way. You do what God says. He tells you what to do and you do it. I've come across so many people that say, oh, you make God out to be some kind of big commander in chief and everything. I don't make him out to be like that. The Bible does. He's capital K, king of kings. You know what kings do? They lay down the law and you obey it. And they enforce it. A capital L, Lord of Lords. Master. But they love the Savior part, and they love the friend part, but they don't like these other titles he has. Emmanuel, God with us. He's God Almighty. God says, this is what you do, you do it. That's the sign of someone gets saved. And there's times we fail, brothers and Christ. There's times I failed. But you have conviction. You remember, if, if any man come after me, he must deny himself and pick up that cross daily and follow Jesus Christ. I drop, I drop my cross daily. We all do. But the difference is, we pick it back up daily. You have some brethren that drop their cross and never pick it back up. You have fakes and frauds that aren't even carrying the cross to begin with. And they'll grab that verse and say, and, and they're lied to by saying all things work together for good. Dropping the cross doesn't work together for good. 
Picking it up back up again does. Getting back to your walk with the Lord, praise God, works together for good. But remember, the thing said that it says all things. When do all things work together for good? First one, to them that love God. Are you taking God's word seriously? Do you have a heartfelt desire that this is perfect, this is the standard, and I need to live God's way? That fear of God. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. There's the verse. First Roman, uh, Revelation 4.11. For Thy pleasure they are and were created. And I always say this, you go back to Ecclesiastes. I love Ecclesiastes, the preacher, the Old Testament. I always say back, but in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes, the preacher, he's going through talking about life. And how everything's vanity without God. All is vanity without God. If there's no God, and there's no eternity, everything's vanity. You have some people who try to teach there is no eternity. It's all, then all things, everything's vanity. But when he gets to the end, he says, okay, I'm going to sum everything up. He could have just said this to begin with. But if he didn't say it the way like God's Word says it, he says it in a way where it reaches anybody it's solid, it's proof, here's all the evidence, it's worthless, it's worthless. And he gets to the, let's hear the whole sum of the matter. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, your whole life, for everyone. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. All things work together for good to them that love God. Do you love God? Not one of those people, I just have a burning in the bosom. It's a feeling I have. It's just, you know, emotions. and It's just, you know, just something we say. No. Does your life prove that you love God? Does it line up with this book? Primarily the Pauline epistles. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He tells us how to live a life of Christ. He teaches us how to be in Christ Jesus. I'm getting ahead of myself again. He teaches us to put on the whole armor of God. He teaches us how to be part of the ministry of reconciliation. How to be a living witness and a verbal witness. How to live a life of sanctification, a holy life, a clean life. Now that you can learn throughout the whole Bible, instruction in righteousness. But fear God and keep His commandments. And for this is the whole duty of man. Now people start saying, oh, you're, he, see, see, he's getting into workspace salvation. Uh, what's the number one commandment for today? Is it keep the Levitical laws? No. Is it get circumcised? No. Is it get water baptized? When there is no water baptism for today. It's spiritually baptized that matters today. It's a whole other discussion. Does he tell you, you know, you've got to clean up your life? No. What's the first command that God gives? Romans 10, 16, for us, for the world today, for the people in the world today. Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? You know the first command God gives is, get saved. Repent, where I'm getting ahead of myself again, repent and go to the cross. Get saved. I can't stress enough that I have people come across my channel that are professing Christians and they learn for the first time what true biblical repentance is because they've been lied to their whole life. Verses ignored. Bible definitions ignored and just cut out of the Bible. They've never heard it. And when they learn what true biblical repentance is as it applies to salvation, they become broken. And they get saved, praise God. No part of my part. It's to God be the glory. I'm just preaching His truth. And there's other brethren out there that preach the true plan of salvation. And people are getting still getting saved in these last days. Which brings us back to the second requirement. First requirement is that you love God. What's loving God? Keeping His Word. The second requirement is to them that are called according to His purpose. Called. What does called mean? 2 Thessalonians 2.14. What is Paul talking about? 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.23 says, But we preach Christ crucified. You know, how he died for our sins. Repentance. 
Notice it says ours, those who are saved, the individual that goes up there, you look at the cross and say, he died for my sins. You throw the old man for the cross. Here's how wicked I am. Here's the wicked man that I am. Oh, wretched man that I am. I'm the chiefest of sinners. And here's the proof. And you're talking to the Lord, not to me, not to anybody down here. You're talking to the Lord and you're throwing it at the foot of the cross saying, Lord, this is how wicked I am. I deserve to go to hell. Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I believe, and you get into the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But unto them which are called, oh sorry, but we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Gentiles foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You say, what are you getting now? We're going to keep going there. Hold your finger there. When it says, those that are called according to His purpose, we are called. You need to get saved and born again. For that verse to apply, it says, all things work together for good. You have to be saved and the, His purpose, born again. Saved and born again. We're going to get to the purpose part, but called, you got to get saved. You mean that verse doesn't apply to the lost world? No, it doesn't. All things work together for good does not apply to the false religions out there with false gospels that Paul yells about saying, if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. If any man preach a gospel which we have not preached, or, or Jesus that we have not, pre have not preached, or get you to receive a spirit that we haven't received, that antichrist spirit, that wo the woman Jezebel, sometimes we call it a Jezebel spirit, but the Bible doesn't use the word spirit. It says that woman Jezebel. You suffer that woman Jezebel. And since that woman Jezebel has been dead for a while, it's this spirit that goes around that gets women to rebel against God. And you have that antichrist spirit that gets the world as a whole to rebel against God. Men and women to rebel against God. Mm -hmm. But unto them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, we'll get into the purpose here in a second. But all things work together for good. You've got to be saved and born again for that verse to apply. And some of the preachers that get up there, they don't talk about this. They just say, you know what? All things work together for good. You know, you're getting into this sin over here, or you're making these bad decisions over here, and you're doing... it all works together for good. No, it doesn't. What works together for good is, if well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but when you meet the requirements, if you fail and you fall to the left or to the right, you don't meet the requirements. And what you're doing doesn't work together for good. However, you can always pick your cross back up and get back to following the Lord. And when you get back to following the Lord, God will get you back on tri track, and now everything is, that happens will work together for good. But you got to get back on that right path. Verse 25 here is because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Remember, why is he saying the foolishness of God? God's not foolish. But what he's saying is, is that Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, to the Greeks, it's foolishness. So he's saying, well, if you think it's foolish, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty and not many noble are called. It goes back to what Jesus was talking about when he was preaching the kingdom of heaven gospel. A reason that a lot of the people that rejected the kingdom of heaven gospel was people that were rich, powerful, had prestige, were in high positions in society, were great in society. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. And he talks about how it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. But now we fast forward to here. Paul's like, hey, instruction righteousness, that still applies to the gospel that's for today, too. What prevents people from getting saved? Lust of the flesh is one. But here what we're talking about, not many wise men after the flesh. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Neither cometh to the light lest their deeds should be reproved. What keeps people from getting truly saved and born again? Repenting and believing. You have all these people, they'll skip repentance. They love skipping repentance. Though I forgot to mention the number one popular false gospel in the world today is easy believism, faith alone. 
a repentless gospel. Why? So you can keep your sin. You probably shouldn't, but it's not a big deal. Your sin that's sending you to hell, that put Jesus on the cross, nailed him to the cross, and he went through everything he went through, being beat without, beyond recognition, having his beard ripped out, being spit upon by people that just a week early were saying, Hosanna in the highest, like, we love you. And then a week later, crucify him. And they nailed him to a cross, and he bled out. But we don't need repentance. We love our sin. What keeps people from getting saved? Flesh. The lust of the flesh. That's why Paul says, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. As a saved sinner, there's a changed life. It's guaranteed after being saved. Okay? Not, was it, uh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. What, the world. Worldliness. Riches, things that this world tries to offer. Status. Okay. Verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in His presence. He's got to break these people down. He's got to humble these people. Remember what the Bible says about Jesus being that stone? Whoever falls upon this stone shall be broken. But whoever this stone falls on, it will grind him to powder. Powder dust. God will do the breaking. And that's what he's talking about here. These men have to get broken to where they're not after the flesh. That they don't think they're mighty. That they don't care about their nobility. They humble themselves. The Bible says he, that God is nigh unto them that have a broken heart and save as such that be of a contrite spirit. That no flesh should glory his presence. In Acts 20, 21 we read, Testify both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. This might be another study, but I'll sneak it in here a little bit. I came across that verse, and if you turn to Acts 20, 21 and you get the context, Paul's telling people in Asia that he kept nothing back from them. He told them the whole gospel. He had nothing back. And he says, repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you, fat, you, you rewind in the early book of Acts. Remember that story that the repentance people always fight? I mean, the non-repentance, the easy believers and the faith alone. They always fight when you have Paul in prison and there's a big earthquake. All the shackles fall off. All the doors come open wide. And the centurion wakes up and he's like, What's going on? He looks around, he sees the doors open, he thinks everyone's fled, so he's about to kill himself. And Paul says, do thee no harm, we're all still here. He comes running in, trembling, fearing God. He falls down on his knees, God is nigh to them that have a broken heart, and say as such that be of a contrite spirit. And he says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And the next verse after it says, he tells him the words of this life, the words of the Lord. Well, we read here that he's looking back and saying, I kept nothing back from any of you. So even though it didn't mention the word repentance, Paul says here in Acts 20, 21, what he's been preaching the whole time, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how I can stand there and say, that centurion, he preached repentance to him. Because if you say he didn't, you're calling Paul a liar. A flat-out liar. Like I said, we might get into that a little bit more in another one, but the Lord showed me that. Okay, You need to sit. You need to stay. I'm house-sitting again. I got, I got more dogs. A lot of dogs over here. But brothers of Christ, them that are called according to His purpose, all things work together for saved sinners, not lost. The only thing that will ever work together for them is that they will start fearing God and obey the gospel. They come to the cross broken. They're coming to God. They're doing things His way. Then all things are going to start working together for good. But you have to be saved for that statement to, to apply. Galatians 1.6 says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from Him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another 
but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Okay? According to his purpose. So you got called. Now we're going to talk about according to his purpose. In the Old Testament, what's our purpose? Remember we already mentioned a little bit of it. Fear, the main purpose of mankind. Fear God and keep his commandments. If we're to please God. That's, that's our purpose. And today what pleases God? Fearing him and coming to the cross in repentance. And believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you. In the Old Testament, if you turn to Ezekiel 33.10, we read, Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Live for the Lord. True living. True life. Brothers of Christ, those of you that with that are truly saved and born again, with proper testimonies, you can testify, not just me, but you testify, that when God saved you, it, you really weren't living until God saved you, and actually gave you a new life, a true life. I wasn't living before. I was just, bare, I was, what does it say, pining away in them, the sins. I was just miserable, and I was just, as long as I kept a flesh high going, like drugs. I told you before, I was addicted to Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, Anime, porn, satanic style music, and it would feed my flesh, you know, gluttony, uh, feeding your flesh, and just having a good time. And anytime all that stopped, that's when I realized I don't really have a life, and it's, I'm miserable. So what they, most people do, they just dive back into it again, to try to hide from their misery and their sorrow. How should we live then? Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I always try to point this out. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Be careful of preachers that start getting high and mighty and they start looks like it's, they start sounding like they have pleasure in telling people they're going to hell. I have no pleasure in telling the lost world they're going to hell. I do it because it's truth. And my heartfelt desire is to see him get saved. But some preachers really get a, really get a joy and a kick out of telling people they're going to hell. Be careful of those people. Okay? I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that, they, but that the wicked turn from his way. Remember, this is Old Testament. They needed to turn from their way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, for why will ye die? Okay? What about when Jesus came? I'm just trying to point out that God's desire, we're going to get to Peter, God's desire is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. His desire is to see people get saved today. He provided a way to say, get saved today. He gave his own life at the cross so that we could have eternal life, that we could go to heaven. His desire is to see people get saved. But you've got to do it his way. You don't get to do it your own way. There is no back door to heaven. There's no many paths that lead to heaven. There's only one way to heaven today. There's only one way. And it's not faith alone. It's not easy believism. I always tell them chapter and verse, they can't do it. You can always tell, I'm going off on a little bit of tangents, forgive me, but you can tell true Bible believers from Bible correctors. When you say chapter and verse on something and they try to make it out like it's not a big deal, who cares whether it's in the Bible or not, you're not dealing with someone who loves the Word of God. You're not dealing with someone who's a Bible believer. You're dealing with someone who's, who might be saved, but they might have lost their way. But at one point when someone got saved, this was it, and we need to do things this way, we need to say things this way. But over time, you can fall away. But you have a lot of false converts with these fake, especially with this topic, with false gospels, that when we say chapter and verse, where's that at in the Bible, and they can't show it in the Bible, their attitude is, who cares? Who cares what God says? Uh, what's the first step? Loving God? What's loving God? You care what God says. You fear Him and you want to know what God says. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. You seek God out. You seek His way out. I did the Bible version issue study. I learned the true plan of salvation found in the King James Bible. True biblical repentance as it applies to salvation. When Jesus came, He said, Luke 9.51 and Luke 9.51... And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfast set his face to go to Jerusalem. 
and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? Let's just destroy them, Lord. Let's just destroy them. But he returned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man, notice it says Son of Man, it's for the kingdom of heaven gospel. But the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Remember when we read in Ezekiel, it's Old Testament, they had to turn from their wickedness so they wouldn't die. And God didn't want to kill them. He, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But if you don't turn from your wickedness and sin, God will destroy you. Here we see that this is Jesus Christ. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. God's seeking to save His creation. People. He wants to see people get saved. And they went to another village. What's God's purpose? He wants you to get saved. And he went to another village. Okay. 2 Peter 3.9 and 2 Peter 3.9 is where we read, and this is, I believe, primarily for the time of Jacob's trouble, but as we're going to find out, it's in every dispensation. God's always saving people by, their, by his grace. How you find the grace is different in different dispensations, but God is saving mankind by his grace, and there's always repentance involved. Always. And they say, well, not today. Yet there's plenty of verses to say it does apply to today. You want to get saved? You've got to repent and believe. It's always been that way. You have to repent and turn to God. Okay, now, I'm not saying sometimes turn means clean up your life. I'm not saying you have to clean up your life. That comes after salvation. But I'm talking about that old man. you disgusted by that old man, and you throw that old man at the foot of the cross. Repent and turn. Repent happens before the turning in the Old Testament, where you had to get your heart right with the Lord. Uh, not heart right, uh, life right. Get the sin out. Okay? But in uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as men, some men count slackness. But as long-suffering to us were, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Some people who are hard, that believe in dispensations will say, that's not talking about today. That's only talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. It is. I believe 2 Peter is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. 1 Peter is for today, but he's addressing the Jews in a way that the Jews will get it. Not the Gentiles. Uh, that's why we got to do a little bit more studying and more rightly dividing to try to get, okay, we, we, can, we understand what he's saying now, even though it, it does apply to us today, but he's saying it in a way that it will reach the Jewish people, his audience, his target audience. Uh, Second Peter says, of like, those that are of like faith. In other words, it's not the same faith of today. It's a different faith. It's a different way of finding God's grace. Right? It's the time of Jacob's trouble. But what about today? People say, you've read all these different... I'm just showing you that God's desire, His purpose for mankind, is that they fear God and keep His commandments. And when you fail, you repent and turn back to God so He can forgive you and save you from yourself. That's always been God's heartfelt desire. Romans 16.25. Remember we just read up there about the power of God? Okay, turn it back here. I got it all highlighted. Oh, that's right, it's over here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, we read about how, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The power of God? What's being talked about there? Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel... And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. There's a lot of Old Testament uh, verses that prophesy Jesus Christ coming and dying and salvation going out to the world. But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of, everlast, of the everlasting God, made known to all nations to the obedience of faith. 
To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever. ever. Amen. Christ forever. Amen. Now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel. Romans 1.16. You want to jump all the way over to Romans 1.16. Remember, you can always pause the video, but I don't want to keep these videos a little bit shorter. Uh, Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God provided a way for us to get saved today. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 20.19 says, Acts 20.19, Serving the Lord with all humility of mine and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews and how I kept back nothing. Here's the voice verse. How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. He kept out nothing about the God. He didn't keep any detail of the gospel, gospel hidden. But have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the faith alone crowd, no repentance, they'll call Paul a liar. Paul was never preaching repentance with, with faith. No, he wasn't. And they ignore this verse. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. Notice it's at the end of Acts. Remember, I believe Acts is a transition book. At the beginning of Acts, they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, and those apostles are in Christ. How do we know that? They had the Holy Spirit. They are in Christ. When Paul says they were in Christ before me, they were in Christ. They were preaching the kingdom of heaven gospel. But somewhere along the way, the heaven, kingdom of heaven gospel, the pause button got hit, and now we've got the gospel that we have today that Paul says, okay, now you want to be in Christ? The kingdom of heaven gospel ain't going to work. You need the gospel that's, that God has revealed to me, to, the, to you, Lord. Now he says, Paul says, it's my gospel. The gospel that God gave me that, to reveal to you. All okay. right. What's the gospel today? Okay. It says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul was always preaching. Because when he got saved... God, Jesus Christ, told him he's going to be going to the Gentiles. He's an apostle to the Gentiles. And you can go through all the different Pauline epistles. He makes, a big, makes it a big deal. He goes out of his way to always mention that he's the apostle to the Gentiles. It always gets me when people misuse the word of God. They'll take that verse where Paul says, Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ, and say, See, we're just supposed to follow Jesus Christ. And they go back to the old the Gospels, where Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, which isn't for today, and they get all messed up. No, Paul said, if you're follow me as I am of Christ. In other words, if you're following Paul, then you're following Christ, because Christ appointed him the, gospel, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles. God shared with him the gospel that's for today. How to get saved today. Okay, But he's always preaching repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. This faith alone, easy to believe in the crowd, they'll come up with something to ignore the word of God. I know they will. But they're calling Paul a liar every time he says Paul with that centurion. Oh, Paul wasn't preaching repentance. Or over here where you see the man's already in a repentant state, so they just, Paul just goes to the second step and says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're already in a repentant state. But Paul says right here, he's always preached repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He held nothing back from anybody he preached to. What do you do with that? Throw it out. That's what they do. That's what they do. Now the two requirements we just went through for all things to work together for good. Making sure I didn't skip. Yeah, okay. Make sure I, get, I want to actually go through the gospel, the true plan of salvation. I can talk the talk, but how about we show the scriptures to back it up? You know, I don't want to be all talk uh, as far as my words. I want to use God's words. That's why, uh, brothers of Christ, it seems today people aren't really enjoying solid Bible studies anymore. They love the talk shows. Some men in ministry have stopped doing solid Bible studies, and they're going to be becoming talk shows. Worldly talk shows, reaction shows. If you follow this ministry, you know I love the Word of God. It's my final authority. Remember my saying that I always say, brothers is Christ? This right here, God's perfect written Word. God is always right, and His Word is always right. That's rule number one. Rule number two, if this man is wrong, 
refer to rule number one. I've always had an open door. If you think I'm wrong on something and I'm not lining up with the scriptures, come talk to me. I've always had an open door. After the first and second admonition, I'll give you two tries. You know, but I've always had an open door because I'm not above this. This is the final authority. Now, the two requirements for all things work together for good, again, love God and, and called. Okay, call according to His purpose. You have to be saved and born again, and you've got to be taking God's Word, hiding in your heart, and living it. Those are the two requirements. Salvation, how do we get saved today? Well, it starts out with fearing God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And a good understanding have all that to keep His commandments. We teach about how sin leads to hell and everyone's on their way to hell because they've sinned against God where's the fear of the Lord it always starts with the fear of the Lord fear of the Lord is what leads people to repentance 2 Corinthians 7 9 we get to repentance for now I rejoice not that you were made sorry but that you sorrowed to repentance for you were made sorry after a godly matter that ye might receive damage by us to nothing for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. To salvation. It comes before God saves you. They can't handle this verse. It comes before the, the faith alone people. It comes before God saves you. Not to be repented of. You'll never turn your back on the true plan of salvation. There are some brethren that I, I might have been wrong about salvation because the moment they turn their back on the true plan of salvation and go to easy believism, i got to treat them like they're lost. And I have to go back to the gospel that they just now rejected. But it says here not to be repented of. You'll never repent on repenting. You'll never say, like, recant. The Catholic recantation. I'm going to recant on repenting. No, you never do. But the sorrows of the world work at death. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. And we've said this a million times. Godly sorrow. Sorrow towards God. For what? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've altogether become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. Depart from me, ye accursed, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. There shall be wailing and cast them in outer darkness. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. For godly sorrow, sorrow towards God, what? For your personal sins that you've sinned against Him that's sending you to hell. He's going to send you to hell, but you've sinned against Him. And you say, Lord, I'm sorry. Oh, wretched man that I am. I'm the chiefest of sinners. I'm so wretched, oh Lord. I'm on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you. I deserve it. Oh Lord, is there no way? Is there no way to get to heaven? Am I just destined to go to hell? I deserve it. And that's where God points you to the cross. And you take that repentance to the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if, ye are saved, if, it's a Bible if, you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. It's all head knowledge. It's not down here. You can miss heaven by 13 inches. You have the knowledge, you know what Jesus did, you know why he did it, and you believe it happened, but it never makes it down here. Why? Because you never repented. It takes repentance to go from here to here. And what does the world not want you to do? They don't want you to repent and believe. They just want you to skip repentance and just believe, unless you have believed in vain. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, I also received, how that Christ died, how he died, and we talk about this all the time, the blood that was shed was God the Father's blood. Okay. He was the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He was nailed to a cross and he bled out. And that blood can wash your sins away. You've got to come to the cross broken and throw the old man at the foot of the cross. Throw your iniquities at the foot of the cross so they can get washed away. But if you hold on to your iniquity, remember King David said, if I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. If you're holding iniquity in your heart, you're saying, well, I love these sins, and I really don't care that I'm a sinner, but you know what? He died, but I don't care that I'm I love my sin. I have no problem with sin. I have no problem with going to hell. 
I'm not bothered by it. I've had people say that. I'm going to hell. So what? Yeah, I'm a sinner. So what? Where's the sorrow? Where's the throwing the old man at the foot of the cross? How he died for our sins. And, that, and you're not supposed to be sorry for that? There's no sorrow involved? Which is godly sorrow? Which is repentance? Having sorrow towards God for your sins? How he died for our sins? How he died and he was put up there and what he went through was because of my sins. And there's not supposed to be any sorrow? Godly sorrow? These people are lost. These faith alone. They're so lost. They're hard in their heart and they're on their way to hell. They don't have to go. If you've come across this video, because some of them still watch me, to try to find me making a mistake, you don't have to go to hell. You can still get saved today. It's not too late. But time is running out. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He rose again the third day proving that he is God because the Godhead rose him from the dead. whole other issue that we've already talked about before. You know, the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. God the Father raised him from the dead. Jesus said, I will raise myself up. The Godhead rose him from the dead proving that he is God. And you have to believe in that resurrection. It's part of the gospel. Some people try to take it out. It's part of the gospel. So is repentance. And they try to take that out. Then they try to take resurrection out. So you have repent. Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Come to repent. Godly sorrow for your personal sins. Throwing it at the foot of the cross. Not holding it in here, but throwing it at the foot of the cross. Romans 10.8 says, But what saith it? The Lord, the word is nigh, I'm sorry, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You repent happens in the heart. You go to the foot of the cross. This is all happening in, in spirit. And, you know, you go to the foot of the cross. You throw your iniquities at the foot of the cross. The old man for the cross showing how wicked you are. And you turn to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I believe that you are God manifest in the flesh. That your blood is God's blood. And that your sacrifice, you died so that I might be saved. And your blood can wash my sins away. And you confess this in prayer. You take it to the Lord in prayer. This is where your prayer life starts. Before God saves you at salvation. Remember, I'll say it again. People always ask, well, if you're lost, how can God hear your prayer? Because King David said, if I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me in the Psalms. So when you have someone who's truly trying to seek salvation, when they come to the cross, they don't hold iniquity in their heart anymore. Because when I was lost, I was a false convert most of my life. Easy believism, faith alone, false convert. I still held iniquity in my heart. I had sin. I loved my sin. I had no problem with half of my sins. The other half of my sins, I had a problem with it, but it did, I still was carnally minded walking after the flesh. Romans chapter 8, the, the mark of someone who's lost. Carnally minded walking after the flesh. The flesh was in charge. When I got saved and born again, I had to come to the cross and say, you know what, I'm not holding on to this stuff anymore. I'm going to throw it at the foot of the cross. So when you've repented in the heart, and you believed in the heart, and you turn to God in prayer, at this point, you're not holding iniquity in your heart. God will hear a prayer of someone like that, that fears God and is turning to Him. That's where your prayer life starts. And you turn to God and say, Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you, Lord. I'm so wicked. I'm without excuse. Remember Job? He's like, I'm without excuse. I, I abhor myself in dust and ash. I just, I have no excuse. I, I, I was wrong. You're right. I'm wrong. Oh, Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. God manifest in the flesh. And that He sacrificed His life that I might be saved. That the blood that was shed is God's blood. And that blood can wash my sins away. And that He was buried and rose again the third day, proving that He is God the Father, God Almighty, the Lord God Almighty. 
For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You know people who try to take prayer out of the gospel? They take credit. Can you believe people actually try to take prayer out of the gospel? Prayer is a work. They're ashamed. They're ashamed that they refuse to throw their iniquities at the foot of the cross, true biblical repentance. They're ashamed of themselves. Which is why they take prayer out too now. Okay. Romans 10.12 says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich all, unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So once you've confessed your repentance and your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, wherever you are, doesn't have to be in a Babel building, doesn't have to be at an altar call, it's just wherever you are. You fall on your, you don't have to f physically fall on your knees, but I did. Fall on your knees and you turn to God in prayer. I had all the knowledge. That's the thing. I had all the knowledge, but the one thing that didn't click was repentance. I've been taught to skip it. And when I truly repented, everything else fell in line. And I confessed both in prayer. And I said, Lord, please save me. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Please save me. I don't deserve it, Lord. Please save me. All these things we've been reading, it talks about you have to do it, and then God will save you. God looks at the heart. And if you truly repented, and that it's not head belief, it's actual faith. Because today people are confusing faith with head belief. Faith with head knowledge. No. True faith. Remember, we for by grace are you saved through faith. Faith, real faith. God looks at the heart. Did you really repent? Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross? You confess both of them in prayer, and it's coming from the heart. Remember, with the heart man believeth unto righteous, or with with the heart man believeth unto righteous, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's coming from the heart. And you ask God to save you. God looks at the heart and saves you. Everything's right. He saves you. He wants to save you. Remember we read about that. He wants to save you. That's why he provided a way to go to heaven. And the gospel is so simple, but it's not easy. You say, well, it's supposed to be. No, only easy believism, faith alone, that garbage over there, it's easy. No, the gospel is simple, and the hard part is coming to the end of yourself. Humbling yourself. That repentance, that first step of fearing God and coming to the cross and throwing your iniquities for the cross and saying, I've been wrong my whole life. You have to humble yourself. Remember we just read about not many mighty, not many noble. All these people that have a high level of pride, self-worth. They go about to justify themselves. Jesus had that problem with the Pharisees. You are, the, you are men which justify yourselves before men and before God. It's hard to get past that and humble yourself and say, I've been wrong all along. I am worthless. My sin and wickedness. It's, it takes a lot to humble. God has to do a lot to break some people. Some people have amazing testimonies where God really broke them to get them to come to the knowledge of the truth. Right. 2 Corinthians 5.17 After salvation, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. There, uh, He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Called according to His purpose. Back to the verse. All things work together for good to them that are, that to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. The purpose is to get saved and have a changed life and start living for Jesus Christ. Start being pleasing in His sight. For thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay. Keeping His word, living God's way. Now that you're saved and born again, you have that new creature in Christ Jesus, new life. I've read a lot of these. Psalms 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp into my feet, a light into my path. I have sworn, and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Psalms 1, 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Psalms 119, 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Psalms 119.11, hop down a couple of verses. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. John 17.17 17 says, Sanctify him through thy truth, thy word is truth. Paul talks about, are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Paul talks about how you're supposed to be a light to this dark world. You're not supposed to blend in with the world. Be not conformed to this world. 
Love not the world. You don't have to be a friend of the world. We're supposed to be separate, putting on the whole armor of God. We're supposed to be a light to this dark world. We're supposed to have sanctification. I'm getting ahead of myself again. <laughs> now, when you meet these two conditions, okay, the change that you get saved, the changed life, and part of that changed life is now I'm taking God's word, I'm hiding it in my heart, and I'm living it. Okay. Now, at this point, all things work together for good, no matter what happens to you. Good, bad. You might say, that people love the gray area. In the middle, between good and bad. No, to me, there's just good and bad. Okay. It all works together for good. Okay. And when you get saved, one of the hardest things you're going to have to do, brothers and Christ, is learn to trust God. That's why Paul was trying to tell you that verse about all things work together for good. He wasn't just saying that so you can go, go, oh, everything works together for good for me. No, good for the Lord. Good for the Lord. Okay? Now, when you meet the two conditions, you will have to trust that whatever you are going through, it is for His glory. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Good to what? For God. To glorify God. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. Some of our understandings, we get selfish and think the good has to be for us. No, no, no. The good is for God, that He might be glorified. There's times we go through hard times to, to be a better witness. Sometimes we, we, we go through different experiences, so we can witness, yet again, for brethren, not for salvation, but to help brethren. Hey, I, I went through these hard times, now I see you're going through these hard times, and you exhort him with the scriptures and you encourage him to stand for the word of God and keep living for Christ, no matter how hard the life is getting. When you see what's going on in the world, you learn to say, hey, God's got that taken care of. We need to stick with the word of God. Some men are in ministry and some of the brethren as a whole are getting distracted by everything that's going on in the world. And that's all they seem, can seem to talk about. They can't seem to preach the word to save their life. We need to be back to preaching the Word of God, standing for the Word of God, hiding our heart, loving our brothers and sisters of Christ, being there for one another, and being a living and verbal witness for the lost world to see people get saved. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Romans eleven thirty six says, for of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Ephesians 1.12 says that we should be the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Romans 8.18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Sometimes we're going to go through hard times. All right? There's times I went through hard times because it was my fault. I made bad decisions. It didn't work together for good because I departed from this and started doing things the flesh's way, the world's way. And I always try to throw in Satan and his ministers where they try to tell you that you can do things their way. That goes contrary to the scriptures. Doctrines of devils when you start steering to the wrong direction. But mainly the flesh is what really got me in trouble as early on as, as a babe in Christ. Okay, they didn't work together for good. I had to humble myself and come back to God. And when I humbled myself, and I turned, and God, well, God humbled me. I almost took the credit from God. Forgive me, O Lord. God humbled me to bring me back to Him. And I came back to Him. That worked together for good because I turned back to God. But when I was in the flesh, it wasn't working together for good. 2 Timothy 2.10 says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake. And he's not talking about sin. He's talking about how the world treats him. He adores all things, how his own people treated him, getting arrested, getting beaten. This is Paul. He goes through all the whole list, you know, and, and perils of waters, and perils by my own countrymen, and perils among false brethren. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And the elect's sake there, it's talking about the election is how to get saved. How to get saved was elected from the very beginning of the world. But anybody can get saved today. Anybody can. There's that living witness, not just a verbal witness that Paul was talking about. He was a living witness. 
No matter what he was going through, he wouldn't turn on this book. He wouldn't turn on the Lord. He wouldn't turn on... I know the book wasn't made, completed at that time, but um, he didn't turn on the word of the Lord. He didn't turn on the gospel. He didn't turn back to the flesh and living like the old man. He stayed the course no matter what hardship he had to go through. All things work together for good. I'll sum it up again. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who hath God has made unto us wisdom. Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. Searching God and his word out is the middle of wisdom. And the end of wisdom is keeping it. Taking God's word once you find it, like I did, the King James Bible, God's perfect written word Jesus. You hide it in your heart and you live it. If you're doing that, all things work together for good. And, oh wait, and righteousness. We talked about that, putting on the whole armor of God. You've got the breastplate of righteousness on. You're now an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You represent Jesus Christ to the world. He's supposed to shine through you. You've got the ministry of reconciliation, being a living witness and a verbal witness. You're doing those things. All things work together for good. Oh wait, there's more. And sanctification. Are you cleaning up your life? Are you letting God clean it up through the Word of God? You stay in the Word of God, you study the Word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And you stay in the Word of God, you're hiding your heart and you're living it, and over time, God says, get that out, you get it out. God says you're supposed to be doing this, you do this. You start your day with the Word of God in prayer, you end the day with the Word of God in prayer. Okay? And so on. Sanctification, getting the sin out. The sin and worldliness out. Now all things work together for good. Oh, one last thing here. And redemption. What are we working towards? That blessed hope. The judgment seat of Christ. It's always on our head and on our heart. It is on mine, brother, says Christ. In these last days, it's definitely on mine. Lord, what do I still need to get done for you? Is there anything else I need to clean up? So that all things can work together for good. That I can be a useful vessel. A vessel unto honor. Remember the potter? I'm the clay. He's the potter. A lot of these false religions, especially the easy believism, they think that they're the potter and God's word is the clay. That God can conform to them. No, no, no. God's the potter. I'm the clay. I, conf he, I conform to his word. And if his word says, get this out, I get it out. If the word says, I'm supposed to do this, I do this. Verse 31, that according is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You're glorying in the Lord. If you're abiding by all four of these things, you're glorying in the Lord. And part of righteousness is the armor of God. Uh, Romans 13, 11. Romans 13, 11. If you're focusing on those four things a lot in your life, brothers and sisters Christ, and your walk with the Lord, in Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time, that now is high time to wake out of sleep. Some of the brethren are starting to act like they're sleeping. You know, they're supposed to have life. Remember we talked about that life, real life. But some of them are starting to backpedal. They're starting to fall back, fall down. They're trying to resurrect the old man. They're starting to look like they're sleeping. There's a little life to them, but it's, it's like they're sleeping. They're almost dead. Remember, sleep is another form of death. It's time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Every day is a step closer to us going home, whether we get caught up in death or we get caught up in life at the day of Christ, the day of redemption, that blessed hope, or we get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble, it's nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Get that sanctification going. Remember your, your righteousness, uh, not your righteousness, that God's righteousness is imputed to you. You put on that breastplate of righteousness. You now serve the Lord. You're a servant of Jesus Christ. Your life belongs to Him. You take His yoke upon you. You're a bondservant to Christ, we say sometimes. Cast off the work of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Some of the brethren have taken off their armor. And they're not that much of a light to the world. Is that you, brother, says Christ? First and foremost, we went through salvation. Are you truly saved and born again? And those of you that are, are you not being that much of a light to this dark world anymore? In order to be a put on the armor of light, you've got to cast off the works of darkness. If you're getting into sin and wickedness, like Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, satanic style music, porn, drunkenness, drugs, holidays, I call them holidays, they call them holidays, but worldly flesh days, covetousness, idolatry, 
You've got to cast all that out or you're not going to be able to shine that well for Jesus Christ. You start to blend in with the darkness. We're not supposed to blend in the darkness. We're not to be conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let us put on the armor of light. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. Not just loving the ways of the world. We're not supposed to love the ways of the world that are contrary to this book, to God's way. We're not to love anything down here more than we love God. For me, the coast, the garden, the chickens, my dog, <laughs> my truck. Uh, I like going to get donuts, uh, not donuts, um, pretzels, homemade pretzels on Monday. But if I have to forego it for fellowship, I'll forego it for fellowship. I've had to a couple times. Going to get pizza, I love going to get a pizza. I try to go get pizza up in Gold Beach, an old-fashioned pizza place, and... It's a good drive. There's the bookstore. I get to go through the books. I found some amazing books. Some of them are over here. Uh, used Bibles, some good old-fashioned old Bibles, King James Bibles. I love that trip. But if the work of the Lord says, God says, hey, I need you to do this instead this month, and I have to forgo that trip, I have to forgo that trip. I'm just trying to use me as an example. But there's brethren out there that choose Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games over serving the Lord and doing what's right by God. Some brethren choose holidays. I've had professing Christians choose drunkenness, alcohol, drugs, uh, sports, organized sports. All kinds of things that promote fleshliness and sin. They're not casting off, they refuse to cast off the works of darkness, yet they're going to stand up there and try to tell us what the Bible says. And they're going to go up there and they're going to try to tell us how to get saved. And you wonder why people don't listen to them that much. Why? Because you need to put on the armor of light and really shine. Remember, this is the condemnation that lies come in the world and men love darkness rather than light. Our, when we put on the armor of light, our light shines onto their darkness and, and, and shows their deeds, how evil they are. People always accuse you, but if you're truly saved and born again to change life, they'll accuse you of being holy. You're just holier than thou. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes. I put on the armor of light which includes sanctification, and it shines. Let us walk honestly as in the day, and not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I'll say it again, you, these two verses, if you really, because you can go all over the Bible doing solid studies on these verses about wisdom and righteousness and, and set, which will lead you to the armor of God. And you go through in Ephesians about the whole armor of God and you go through that and you get those things down, all things are going to work together for good. All things are going to work together for good. Another reminder real quick to keep your eyes. Why do we try to struggle to make sure we're living a life of Christ so all things work together for good for Him. Not for us, for Him. All things work together for good. We always try to make it about us. It's me, me, I, I, now, now, now. I want it now, now, now. Paul talked about being content with food and raiment, mainly to a man in ministry, but some people need to learn to be content and realize that it's for His glory and for His good that I'm still here. That I'm still able to serve him. Okay. Titus 2.11 says, for, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Remember that elect part? Well, it's just for certain people. Calvinism. No Calvinism at all. It says all men. All means all. I know some people can't handle that when the Bible says all. All means all. Anybody can get saved today. And when you get saved and born again, Te verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Remember we read over there? It said, uh, casting off the works of darkness, teaching us denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, let us put on the armor of light, and godly, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the present, in this present world, because you're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness. And why what motivates us to do this? Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. That's what it means to look for it. You're living the life of Christ. You're making sure your life is ready that when Jesus calls you home, you can be like Paul that said, I have finished my course, I have fought the good fight. That when you get called home, you know that you're ready. 
We're supposed to be striving to be ready every day, brother says Christ. And there's times where I lost sight of the blessed hope and I, I started falling down and God had to remind me, what if I came back today? Are you ready? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. This does work together for good, regardless. You don't want to be falling flat on your face, but we get caught home. Praise God, it's time to go home. We're done with this walk of our life. We get to start a whole new walk with the Lord. A new beginning. Verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort, rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. Looking for that blessed hope. And 2 Corinthians 5, 6, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We're supposed to trust that God knows what's going on in the world. And He's got that all taken care of. And we need to focus on our walk with the Lord and living for Him and loving our brothers and sisters in Christ and loving the lost world by preaching the truth to Him. To see Him get saved. We are confident, I say, and rather willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Whether it be good or bad. We're going to have to answer for it. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. You say, you're trying to scare me, Brother Philip. Yes. I'm trying to scare you back in line. I'm trying to scare you back into the path that God set for you. That you're living the life of Christ. Jesus could call us home any day now. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. When you do get called up, are you going to be ready? When you get to that judgment seat of Christ, are most of your works going to survive the fire? Gold, silver, and precious stones. Is that most of your life with Jesus Christ? Or is most of your walk with Jesus Christ wood, hay, and stubble? The wood, hay, and stubble don't work together for good. The gold, silver, and precious stones do. Those three things. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap at the judgment seat of Christ. For us who are saved. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap to the flesh corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reach life, reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Doing the verse again, because reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Lately, brothers of Christ, we might do a study on this in the future, that how the brethren are treating one another today is just horrible. I've had brethren say, I love you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. I'm praying for you, brother. And the next minute, they're stabbing me in the back. They're stabbing me in the heart. They're yelling, crucify him. One minute, I'm not Hosanna in the highest, but you know, one minute they had that attitude, I love you. When they told Jesus, Hosanna in the highest, the next minute they're saying, crucify him. One minute they're like, I love you, brother. The next minute, crucify him. We're not treating each other right, according to this book. We're not loving our brothers and sisters in Christ like we should. Everyone's part of respect or persons and doing whatever. I'm part of this group. I'm part of that group. I'm just an online Christian and the rest of the world, what we've been talking about here. Getting your life right with the Lord. Getting your life right with the Lord. 1 Corinthians, we'll end it with this one, verse. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you are bought with a price. Jesus paid for my sins at the cross. His blood his sacrifice. I was bought with a price. I belong to Jesus Christ. Do you belong to Jesus Christ or do you belong to yourself? Your life will show who you truly serve. Your life will show if you're really a King James Bible believer. Your life will. Do you stand for this book or do you correct this book and change this book so you continue living the life you want to live, a worldly life? Are you living a godly life? Are you putting on Jesus Christ, putting on that armor of light? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit.
which are God's. If you truly, truly belong to God, and you're taking His Word, and you're hiding in your heart, and you're doing your best to live it, brother, says Christ, all things will work together for good. All things will. No matter what you're going through. And I've tried to exhort the brethren. Some of them feel like you want to give up. Some of you feel like you're the only ones. We did that study of I only, I only am left. Uh, Elijah, he thought he got so de despaired and so depressed and all, all the hardship that he had to go through. And he, he had to go through a lot of it alone. He thought that, you know, I just want to give up. I just want to die. God's like, you're not alone. I'm with you. Brothers Christ, you're not alone. For you are bought with a the price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirits, which are God's. Be not weary in well-doing, for we shall reap if we faint not. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Keep your eyes on that blessed hope. Keep look, uh, uh, remembering the judgment seat of Christ. Put on the whole armor of God. Remember wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Make sure that all things will work together for good. As long as you love God and you're called according to His purpose. So lost people, that verse doesn't apply to. Save people that are getting distracted and you're not loving God anymore. You're starting to love your flesh more than you love God. You start loving the world more than you love God. You start falling in the trap of loving the enemy and doing things the enemy's way. Satan and his ministers, you start getting into doctrine. That verse doesn't apply to you either. You have to follow both. You have to be saved, and you have to be hiding God's Word in your heart and living it. Then all things work together for good. I'm going to go ahead and end this with grace and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.